and welcome to another quilt story. I'm Lisa Walton and today I'm very pleased to be talking to Victoria Finlay Wolf, who normally has her store in New York and works really really hard there but due to the virus she has relocated everything to her home in Long Island so that's where I'm speaking to her now and if you're wondering who this person is on the screen um, I got a I got a big shock and I thought, no, because I've been looking at a, a very short head photo, no glasses. And then this lady has appeared on the screen. I recognise you now. <laughs> glasses. <laughs> Welcome, Victoria. Do you want to tell us about your beautiful haircut? I've had that short hair forever, but I haven't had a haircut since January. And, you know, I thought it was a really classy haircut, but it just grew out into this bowl cut. And, you know... It's it's working for now because I don't have much of a choice. <laughs> Nobody knows who I am. I could pass anybody on the street. I got a mask on. I got my glasses on. I got the hair. I, I'm incognito. So. I think you're very lucky that it's grown out into such an attractive shape because some people <laughs> don't. But no, it's looking really good. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me on. So oh I could actually put pants on and do makeup and all that good stuff because I don't have to do that when I'm home all day long. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to switch over to our screen where everyone will be confronted with a completely different you. Actually, the more, <laughs> the more I look at you now, the more I prefer for your current cut, so I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> Thanks for having me on to talk a little bit about whatever we want to talk about. I'm so enjoying doing these because I'm feeling connected and I know a lot of people are feeling totally disconnected. And for me, it's like, oh, I'm just talking to these really interesting people every day. This is really good. That's so good. we're going to talk about two quilts today. The first one is called Cloudy Day. And I'm going to get you to give me the story about why you picked two quilts. Well, I think it's just kind of important because one of the things that I get often is, you know, I'm being, being very prolific. I crank out a lot of work. I work very quickly. And, you know, I can do a lecture or a class and tell you all the techniques and everything else. And you hear the stuff, but sometimes being able to see the examples of something where I can work very quickly through to get from the beginning of a quilt to the end of a quilt. Because, you know, that question quilters get all the time about, oh, God, that must have taken you forever to make that quilt. This one in particular on the cloudy day quilt, I wanted to put this one in here because this quilt took me a day to make. Okay. Usually surprises people, right? <laughs> Yes, because it looks it's, uh, very complicated. Yeah, so um, it's a quilt that I'm, I absolutely love. It's one of my favorite quilts. And it has a, an interesting story to it, but it's also a great place to kind of talk about, you know, process and how do you, how do you jump start it and get it going really quickly. So I had been having an exhibit of double wedding rings and it was a lot of older work. And at the time I wanted to be able to get a few more new pieces in, which left me with about three to five days to be able to get some new work done. And that alone sounds like a crazy um, kind of a t amount of time to be able to finish something, but I actually finished using this as an inspiration and a springboard to be able to jump in and explore a pattern that uh, I, and a design that I'd already worked in before is a great way to sort of re jumpstart your creative process to look at it again and go, okay, I've done that. Now, what can I do with it? And as I was leaving New York city to go out to my house, which is where I was make where I am now um, on Long Island, I grabbed a bunch of fabric that I really, I wanted something I hadn't, I don't really work with. I don't work in grays very often. I, you know, I, I like color clearly. And so I grabbed everything of gray that I had quickly. I had like 10 minutes to grab fabric. I threw a bunch of gray reproductions in the, in the bag. I threw some gray batiks in the bag. This gray piece of um, double, uh, double gauze, that uh, like soft baby quilt, blanket kind of stuff that you make for little little ones that's what that dot fabric is it's and I put through that all in the bag and brought it out to the house and thought okay so let's just jump in here and see what I got I didn't have a lot of extra fabric out here so whatever was in the bag is what went into the quilt so I started right away by diving in and starting with a dark deep center knowing that I was going to have that medium gray out on the outside edge of the quilt and I had to make decisions very very quickly and I find that that's one point that can be very difficult for people to do is to just to make decisions quickly it's to cut stuff up you know I cut way more fabric way more shapes than I'll ever need for a quilt 
Um, but I, it's mine. It's my fabric. I purchased it. I can do what I want with it. So you buy it to cut it up. Um, it's not precious. You are, right? That kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I cut a million different pieces and I start auditioning them and throwing them on the wall to see, you know, what kind of effect am I going to get? So in that bag, I didn't have a lot of color or solids. I did have a small scrap piece of yellow, which actually limited me, which is also a really good thing to kind of do to yourself sometimes is to limit your options. You have to make work what you have. So I had a light yellow that was going to be my only pop of color. And I really had to look carefully at where could I use that for the best effect. The weird big diamonds out there with like the Dalmatian spots on it, that's actually a linen. So if you think about, I've got batiks, I've got, you know, repro and little cute uh, calico charm ca uh, cottons in there. I've got the linen. There's just, there's all these different weights of fabric, but you know, if you're cutting things correctly to fit together, they can all sew together and live together harmoniously. Mm -hmm. I'm also auditioning very, very quickly. You know, I find that people don't want to cut the shapes. They want to just put the whole yard of fabric up on the wall and look at it and then go, hmm, I wonder if that looks good. What do I think about that? And it's not so much about thinking, it's about seeing. Right. If you cut the shape and put it on the wall, it's going to look differently, right? So getting people to cut and, and make those decisions quickly, especially when you only got a day to get something done, you have to move quickly and make choices. Now you can see in this one also that you know, a lot of these fabrics are not the same because I didn't have enough. So I would change the fabric that was going around. But that whole time that I'm doing that, I'm, I'm putting things in different positions. I'm looking at them to go, where am I gonna get the most bang for my buck out of the few pieces that I have? Here, of course, I was auditioning the background of my uh, star and decided that, that a lighter version, the batik that I used in the middle around the dark gray star, I wanted to be able to pull that lightness back to the outside of the star. So I, I duplicated that fabric and mostly it was probably because that was what I had the most of. So sometimes just going the, with the flow to see, you know, is that gonna work? And the whole time I'm, I'm keeping that polka dot fabric on the side, hanging there going, hmm, I wonder what that's gonna be. Where is that gonna fall in this quilt? It's really good, but when you think about all the different kind of fabrics, like I said, that I was using in there, so batiks and the linens and the cottons, and then using that gauze fabric, which is shifty and all over the place, yeah. kind of a crazy choice to make when you're about to, you know, you're trying to wrap it up and get it done in a day. Did you stabilize it at all? I did not because I did not have time. Yeah, but right. we're going to look at that a little bit further. But, you know, oftentimes another way to kind of help you get outside of your box is always to look at something in a slightly different way. So here you can see as I'm building the star, I'm, I'm actually putting it on the wall and looking at it in the same format as you would in a book. That's the way you're going to see it illustrated. But mm -hmm. turning it, turning it and putting it on point is always a great way to sort of make you look to see what you actually have there and to see is there any other options and opportunities that you can do. So if you find that you're stuck, I always hear people say that they're stuck. I like to say that I'm never stuck. Um, I'm always just waiting for the opportunity to hit. So I try to take that anything negative talk out of my studio. There's no room for negativity and creativity. So it's always the opportunity, whatever's presenting itself at that moment. So here, putting it on point, and then going ahead and dropping in my background pieces, knowing that I wanted to kind of pull that darkness from the inside of the star to the outside of the star. And then I was pretty much just cutting up whatever fabrics I had left to start piecing my double wedding ring pieces that were gonna go around. Here I started auditioning. Obviously I found one little scrap of lavender and I thought, well, that's, I just hated that. I thought that was just silly. So I took that out. I also put that little yellow dot in the middle and I thought, well, maybe but ultimately decided that with that dark value around the outside that I really wanted to keep the white in those little melons so that you really get a glow. And it's also helping differentiate from the background fabric that I'm about to lay this piece onto. Mm -hmm. I also like that when I was working on this that the hard edge of the star, the sort of angular shapes, those you know 90 degree angles, that are happening there and then that mixture of the curves of the double wedding ring and also of the dots so the dots in the border fabric the dots in the middle of the quilt the dots on those linen big diamonds right so i decided that that was a good place to be able to make the connection for the story of the quilt 
how else could I finish keeping that sort of hard angle and, and the soft round edges being the theme of this whole quilt. So as I started cutting out the borders for this around the outside, guess what I found out? Didn't have enough, Didn't have enough fabric. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't enough to work its way all the way around. But I thought, okay, so I have the hard angles and the soft angles. What else can I do with those hard angles? And as I was looking through the bag of the other fabrics that I had purchased, I had this other piece of Japanese linen that had these strong blue lines on them and also some little white scribbly circles and things on the fabric. And I thought, well, that's perfect. That really helps tie together that story. So I was able to cut those pieces out. Remember, those are linen and that background is gauze. So I'm, I'm sewing something that's completely shifty and unreasonable to sewing it to something that just doesn't move whatsoever. So I thought as long as I'm putting those hard edges of those blue lines in the bottom, then I need to be able to put that blue and the yellow back into the quilt at some point. So there you can see that I started adding those little hits of blue to mimic the dots that are going around the quilt. And one of the, what I'm actually doing is actually telling you where to look in the quilt, right? So the bottom triangles of blue are pointing into the quilt. You're looking up to the star and you're catching the side of that blue. So I'm getting you to look from one end of the quilt all the way around to the other side of the quilt. That's one of the things I love about designing quilts is, is telling you where I want you to look. So now that you look at it here where it was all quilted, this is before I even put binding on it, that there is one little dot of dark yellow on that upper left side. There's a light yellow up on the right, right? There's a couple of different values of blue that are going on in there. All of that is telling, you know, the viewer where they need to look around that quilt because you see a certain dot before you'll see the other dots. And a way he so, is. Yeah, and so also the wavy edge. So as I'd said that about the hard angles and the curvy edge, I decided that the edge of the quilt needed to tell that story as well. So I could have some straight edges, I could have some curvy edges, right? And I can finish it off that way. When you, when you see that last um, image before it was all sewn together, you can tell, actually from all the slides, when you start out, do you see how dark it was? Yeah. <laughs> so we're not talking just like a few hours during the day. This was a start in the morning and finished by the time it was dark outside. <laughs> so that is a full day's work. The quilting was done by Frank Palmer and we had several conversations about what needed to happen there. So pretty much everything I said here is what I was explaining to him as we were working on it, um, mm -hmm. the quilting pattern. So he added, I wanted some extra little cross sort of hard edge cross um, quilting. There's a couple down on the bottom, you can kind of see that. There's a lot of pebbling going on. There's a lot of straight line hard edge work, sort of carrying that whole concept of what the design of the quilt was happening, that that was also happening through the quilting and taking elements just from the fabrics themselves and putting that into the quilting behind it. But I always love it when people look at this quilt and they're like, oh my God, did you applique all those dots on there? And I'm like, nope, four, four dots, that's all I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I did, and they're beautifully done. Yeah, 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 I, I did all of those. Yeah, took them forever. It's a very impressive one-day quilt, very impressive. It's lovely. Yeah, and so that's a, just a, a really good exercise to do when you feel that you don't know where you're going with a project, right? Mm -hmm. So a long time ago, when I first got into blogging and had my website 15 Minutes of Play, I actually did a challenge with um, my followers. It was an interactive website. So people were participating and posting along with their work as I would give them challenges. This was actually the challenge. So the challenge was that they had to find a painting that they could use as inspiration. Could be anything. Mine is the middle piece there. It's a Matisse image up in the front. And you had three minutes to cut fabric and throw it up on the wall. So what does that make you do? It makes you look at shape form, line, pattern, color, and you have to make those decisions really quickly. Are you gonna nail it, the design completely? No, but you're kind of training your eyeballs to work in a different way, because I find that people spend so much time thinking about what something is gonna look like instead of just getting it on the wall and see what, what can work, right? Yep. So it's not, it's not the most beautiful quilt. It's a quilt that I use just around my house, totally fine. But and you don't have to do it as a full bed size quilt. You do it as a small challenge to be able to just 
train yourself to look at things in a different way. And that frees you up because I find people have just the hardest time making decisions about something. They agonize over it. Is that the right red? Or is that the right red? Or is that the right red? Right? You make all these, just pick a red. Nobody else is ever going to know that you deliberated over that. <laughs> I got so many quilts in my head I got to get made in my lifetime. I ain't got time to sit around and figure out if that's the right red or not. Just pick one. This is also an example of how when inspiration doesn't happen in a day. So this is based on a commission quilt that I did and I do a lot of commission work for people and the catch on my commissions is that you can't tell me what you want. You can look through my book, you can, you know, Playing With Purpose is a retrospective of 35 years of my quilt making. So there's a lot there to see, there's a lot there to look through, there's old stuff, there's new stuff. And find something that you're inspired by or that you're drawn to, to give me a starting place. And then you can tell me about what it is that you're, you know, why are you making this quilt? Why do you want this made? What is your inspirational thought? And um, a lady came to me and she said, my mother had passed away and I'm looking for you to make a quilt that represents my mother. And I said, okay. So we had several conversations and I said, look, I said, yeah, I need a little bit of information so that I get a feel for what, you know, who your mother was. And she came back with me for like, with like five or six pages of information, which is a lot of information. So this this woman was a very interesting woman. She lived in Japan for a while. She lived in Ohio. She lived in, she was like the head of the lacrosse. She was a waitress at one point. She wanted to move to a farm and raise buffalo and llama. And she was big in mahjong and you know, I said lacrosse and just to all of these different random things of this information that I got. And I thought, wow, how am I gonna make a quilt that represents all of that. So this was a highly educated woman and she did everything under the sun. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to take this quilt, quilt that I was showing you there. And I thought I'll take those memories. One of the memories was of the daughter going with her mother to see Beverly Sills in New York City. And the other one was about the farm and the farm had the red barn and the pond and all of this stuff. And so I, I took this quilt and for over a year, I usually do a year out for completion date on my commission quilts. And this over a year went by and I was like, I just this is just not going anywhere this is just I couldn't come up with a way to pull it all together and I finally and in, instead of just chucking it or saying I can't do this I kind of read back through all the information and when I was talking to her um, about whether or not I needed to do this job she said why do you do what you do and I said well I do it for the journey the journey that the quilt takes me on you know, I'm all about the process. I like the start of the quilt. I like making the quilt. When I get to the finished end, I'm just not interested in it anymore. So it's everything that gets me to it. You probably relate to that too, Lisa, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So that process, it's, it's, I call it an extreme sport quilting because, you know, we're taking risks. We're doing all of these interesting things. We're cutting all of this stuff. We're putting it all back together. And the risk taking, I think, is the part that gets hard for people to, you know, besides making decisions, but, you know, taking that risk to just cut the fabric and look at it. So risk taking is really the only way that you can really push through to see, you know, what can you do? How can you push your own limits to do something interesting? So after a year of this, I was like, I don't know. And she said, well, I said, I do this for the journey. And she said, well, you have to do this quilt because that's what my mother always said. It's all about the journey. And I was like, wow, that was really cool. So that was sort of after a year of having this conversation with her. I went to bed that night after reading through all of the information again, and I dreamed this quilt. This, that sounds so hokey and so crazy. This never happens. Might I just say that this never happens, okay? But I woke up in the morning and I thought, I know exactly what I'm gonna do with this quilt. I cut this quilt out in a day. So now it's been 13 to 14 months. I had no idea. I scrapped the whole original idea, that original quilt top that I had and that I was working on. Scrapped the whole thing except for the concept of that block. The block that's on point is the same style of block that was in the original 
quilt top that I started to work with. But then I started, I had her purchase all of these random fabrics that represented her mother. She was sending me these dragon fabrics and buffalo fabrics and flowers and sunflowers and that she had feed sack curtains in her house. So I had feed sacks in there and there's Japanese fabrics in there. There's, she's a gardener. So uh, taking this whole random pile of fabrics that she sent me and I was like, how am I going to make all of this like look good together? I ultimately decided that um, she had said that her mother, when she was in the hospital, she passed away of a brain tumor. When she was in the hospital, she'd asked for a denim quilt that was, that she had, and she wanted it for the weight of that quilt for comfort. And I thought, well, that's, that's just pretty powerful and amazing. So I used the denim color and she always wore a red bandana. So I chose the red and that blue as the power colors, as someone who, you know, to represent everything that this woman has done in her life, all of her achievements. And then the daughter stumbled across a a thrift shop and saw an old kimono in the window. And she goes, is it crazy if I send this to you? Can you cut this and put this into the quilt? Because it makes me think of my mother. So down the middle of this quilt, you'll see the four center concave square that has all this crazy silk embroidery from the kimono. You know, again, it's a variety of fabrics and textures, putting it all together, made the quilt in a day. And I thought, you know, that that just sums up about, you know, why do we do this? It's it's the journey of creating something. And and so when you when you think about getting, you know, if you're frustrated on the process of, you know, getting to the end of something, just put it aside and don't rush it but just pull it out once in a while and have a look at it. And that stuff sort of reignites. So my going back and revisiting and having conversations with her and reading through all of the information and stuff that they gave, I found it when I read through that information at the end, one of the things that caught my attention was that she said she was the president of the clown council. I didn't know there was a clown council, but I thought that was amazing. And so I went and I fussy cut those blocks with the red dots to symbolize the red clown nose and put that touch right into the end of the quilt. It's kind of the last sort of piece of the puzzle that kind of fit right in there. And I thought, wow, you know, that quilt really took me on a journey. But I literally woke up, saw this quilt, knew how to do it. Because she gave me so much information, I was like, I didn't, I didn't want to leave anything out by that point. So I actually did go to Spoonflower and took all of the information that I couldn't represent in a fabric and I made a fabric. So like, she loved to make zucchini bread. I used guest check fabric because she used to be a waitress. And then one of the quotes is on here because I was one once and I know how tough it is and how little they make. So she was known to be a heavy tipper. And I thought, how do I put that into a quilt? <laughs> so I used everything that I could pop simply use and put it inside of this quilt and you know, love poems from her husband and just so many magical things that I, this woman had such an amazing life that I felt so connected to her. And what this quilt has given me back is just like, that just proves quilts don't have to happen in a day. They happen when they happen. If you have a lot of UFO projects, you don't need to feel bad about that. Just pull them out once in a while, have a look at them. Maybe you weren't ready at that time to, you know, see it to the end, but maybe you are now. Yeah, right? see if they're ready to talk to you and tell you what they exactly. want to do. Exactly. And that is exactly what this quilt does. Um, she always said she was a dreamer. I was just noticing some of these other fabrics in there. And I thought, you know what? I get that. So there's a fabric with the clouds on it there in the middle. It's very you, but it's also obviously this woman. And it's just what it's supposed to be, really, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. And the, the, it always comes back to that thing that she said about, you know, it's all about the journey. You know, that's, that's really what this is all about is you should be doing, if you, if you're doing this and you love it, great. Then stop fretting about making mistakes because you don't learn anything. If you don't make a mistake, push it further. Don't worry if you can't finish it right away. Don't worry if you don't have the right skill to finish it right now. You can always come back later and revisit it and bring your new eyeballs to those new projects and really stretch yourself and come up with something that's unique. You know, I'd like to think about this. I like to think about, you know, I have a quilt actually. I made it a while ago about, you know, what is the quilt that you can make that could sum up who you are? Have you made a quilt like that? Do you have something that you've made that you think represents you? Possibly. I'm not, people talk a lot about finding their voice and I sort of always find that a bit sort of airy fairy, but I, I can see what it is when I look at your quilts. It's definitely your voice. It doesn't matter 
um, which fabrics you use or which pattern, but there's always, there's always part of you in there. And yeah, I think I need to work more on finding my voice as soon as I work out what that is. Oh, I think you definitely have your voice. But mm. I, I think it's just about, you know, think, think about what you're putting in there. I have a quilt called Farm Girl and it's, you know, my husband's clothes, my daughter's clothes, it's my clothes, it's my friend's clothes and it's scrappy and it's just all kinds of stuff put together. Um, you know, when you're thinking about the fabric choices and what you're putting into it and, you know, things that kind of represent who you are, it doesn't have to be obvious what, what that is or not necessarily to look like you, but it's just about you. So this quilt is, is called Textured Travel and Happiness and the Responsibilities of Dreams. Because this one was a dreamer and this quilt came to me in a dream. I just, I, I feel like it's a magical quilt. I feel honored that they came to me and asked me to make this quilt. It was a very hard quilt for me to work on and to get through. But when it did happen and it fell into place, God, that feels so good. <laughs> it feels so good. I'm in awe of your ability to pull that together in a day and also <laughs> to... That does not happen all the time. <laughs> I, I belong I belong to a group called Cloth in Common and we have two months to do each prompt and I tend to think about it for four to six weeks and then make it in the final couple of weeks and if yeah. I don't do that if I don't have that thinking process and it, it does it goes around it and around in my turns head. Off. Yeah mm. it never turns off it keeps going all the time but as soon as you like make that one click of a connection and you get that moment when your goosebumps go off and you make, as soon as you can make that emotional connection to it, you are off and running. I think also because we, we actually have the skills to make the quilts that we want to make. Yes. It's just getting that final design or process ready to go in our head. And then, yeah, we can just go and-, and That's also why I wanted to show that three minute quilt because they don't have to be pretty. You just have to make it. And then go make another one. You know, Definitely. you just have to get through that to be able to get to the next point. So, because if it just sits there in the box on the cutting table, you ain't gonna get anywhere. So, <laughs> you've inspired me to go and pull out some um, UFOs. I have well, a few. We'll cut that stuff up. Make cool quilts. You already do. <laughs> this has been been fascinating. Thank you so much for your time. It's very enlightening. Um, I'm hoping everyone has also enjoyed the, this learning experience and, and getting to know some of the thought processes in your head and the opportunities to make something in a day or to take a year, a year and a half, doesn't really matter. And if you've enjoyed the video, please hit the subscribe button down below so that I can um, make lots more. I'm really enjoying meeting these amazing quilters. And so I'd like to thank you so much for your time today. All, there, all the way over there in Long Island in the heat. I look forward to seeing what else you produce in your lockdown period. So <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. Okay, bye. everyone. Bye for now.